Hello, everyone. I'm Susie Rosen Singleton, Chief of the Disability Rights Office and the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Welcome to our DVC Direct Video Calling Forum. We're so excited to have you here with us today. We do plan to provide brief visual descriptions, so we will be doing that throughout the panel. I am a white person, blonde, a patterned dress, black blazer. And so with that, I would like to get the program started. We have an outstanding panel, speakers, exhibitors, much to do today and in only three hours time. So very much looking forward to taking your questions. And with that, we will kick off this event. I am honored to introduce Chairwoman Rosen Worsell to begin with opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Susie. Good afternoon. I'm Jessica rosen -Warsel, and I'm the chairwoman of the Federal Communications Commission, and it's a delight to have you all here today. Now, my colleagues in the Commission's Disability Rights Office have given me a name sign, so I will share it with you. And it is my honor to welcome you to our direct video calling forum. I also want to wish everyone a happy Disability Pride Month. Last Friday marked the 34th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And today's forum, we can, uh, we can advance the landmark law's promise of expanded opportunities for individuals who are deaf, deaf blind, hard of hearing, or have speech disabilities it all seems like a fitting celebration. Now, one of the FCC's goals that I have set out as chairwoman is advancing accessibility in all of our rules, policies, services, and programs. Another goal I have set out is encouraging all federal agencies to advance accessibility in their rules, policies, and programs. And that's the purpose of today's forum. The use of direct video calling between two ASL users allows them to communicate directly without a third party intermediary. We'll hear today how DVC can improve access to communications with federal agencies and how it can help facilitate access to federal programs and services for people who use ASL. And in the spirit of the ADA, I'm proud of another anniversary this one you might not know about. This year is the 10th anniversary of the FCC's ASL customer support line. The FCC's ASL customer support line is a huge success. It handles over 1,000 calls a year. The FCC's ASL customer support line not only allows the agency to quickly address complex issues brought to our attention by ASL callers, but it also allows the Commission to work closely with other federal agencies to coordinate resolution of ASL callers' concerns. Now, direct video calling has made this 10-year-old tool even more effective. And the ASL callers are deeply appreciative. They repeatedly tell us how much they need to have someone address their issues and complaints in their own language. With the use of direct video calling, long-standing concerns can now be communicated and resolved far more quickly. One caller described the addition of direct video calling to our support line as an epiphany. During today's forum, our panels of experts are going to explain how other federal agencies can achieve the same results and why they should implement direct video calling. With new digital tools and the enthusiasm of the people in this room and watching us online, we're gonna do big things to make the digital future work for all of us, the deaf and hard of hearing included. Thank you so much to everyone here for being a part of this effort. so much, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, for your support. It means so much for this effort 
to expand direct video calling across the federal government. Thank you. Next, we will be providing an overview on two items. The first is the White House executive orders, those that have encouraged accessible federal customer service. And secondly, what DVC means in terms of legal purposes? What are the rules and regulations surrounding it? I'd like to start by inviting the White House Domestic Policy Council Director for Disability Policy, Rachel Patterson, as well as Bill Wallace, who is an attorney within the Disability Rights Office in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. And we will be speaking about DVC following the executive order. Thank you both so much for being here and sharing your wisdom. Okay, I think I go first. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Rachel Patterson. I'm Director of Disability Policy for the White House Domestic Policy Council. I'm a white woman with brown hair and glasses uh, wearing a gray suit. And just a second ago, as I was preparing for this, I was like, what, what color am I wearing? I had to double check. Um, <laughs> happy Disability Pride Month. Uh, it's been a very, very eventful month, and I'm very excited to be here with all of you. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is how President Biden has centered equity and access since day one. On the first day of the administration, he issued an executive order on equity, saying the policy of my administration is that the federal government should pursue a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all. And he called on every single agency, a whole of government approach to create that plan for how they would advance equity. Assessing their programs and whether their policies perpetuate systemic barriers to opportunities for people of color and other underserved groups. This means promoting equitable delivery of federal government benefits and other opportunities. Then in February of 2023, he signed another executive order requiring, er, order requiring annual reporting from agencies, wanting the agencies to tell the White House every single year what they were doing to advance equity through all of their programs and policies, and that included for people with disabilities. It specifically directed the Office for Civil Rights in each agency to focus on improving accessibility for people with disabilities and language access more broadly. And these were supported by an idea that we re repeat a lot at the Domestic Policy Council, that President Biden believes America is big enough for everyone to succeed. And when any segment of society is denied the full promise of our nation, everyone is held back. In December of 2021, the President signed a slightly different executive order, but really fits with what we're talking about today. And that's the order on transforming federal customer experience and service delivery to rebuild trust in government. And I'm really struck by the connection of those two ideas of improving customer service delivery, meaning rebuilding trust in government, that the federal government is here for all of the people and that the federal government's services should meet and serve all of the people. And I think accessibility is absolutely essential to that. Uh, I'm gonna read a part of it. They say, we must use technology to modernize government and implement services that are simple to use, accessible, equitable, protective, transparent, and responsive for all people in the United States. We must modernize government and implement services that are, uh, oh, I wrote it down twice. But you understand how, how struck I was by that, by that quote, by that message from the president to all of the agencies on making a government that really serves the people. Further in federal government accessibility, in December of last year, uh, our Office of Management and Budget sent a memo to all of the federal agencies on 508 compliance. We are again reporting, requiring annual reporting from the agencies on how they are making their technology more accessible. And the White House is taking this seriously and we want to see improvements. And then the last executive order that I'll talk about is on, uh, was issued in June of 2021 on advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the federal workforce. So when you combine all of these together, we are trying to make sure that our federal government services meet the needs of the people, rebuild trust in government, 
but also that we have a federal government that reflects the United States and provides opportunities for talented Americans to provide their services to the people. Uh, we are trying to promote equity inside and out, uh, ensuring uh, accessibility for people with disabilities. And, and before we started, before we sat down, we were sort of mingling, and one of the, the issues that came up naturally was opportunities for employment within the federal government of people with disabilities. So I think it's really, really exciting to, to put all of these things together before we, we jump into today's content and think about how all of this fits within the leadership of what the president has been trying to do to build an America, to support an America that's big enough for all folks to succeed and where all folks deserve to be included. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Rachel Patterson. Good afternoon. I am Bill Wallace, an attorney advisor in the FCC's Disability Rights Office. I am an older white man with glasses and gray and brown hair wearing a brown check jacket. The Disability Rights Office is very pleased to have you all here today to learn how implementing direct video calling can help remove barriers to accessing federal government programs and services. I'm going to give you some background information on DVC and the FCC's rules related to DVC. Direct video calling is an internet-based video communication service that allows conversations to occur between two parties using American Sign Language. By allowing an individual and the representative of an agency to sign directly to each other, DVC can help facilitate effective communication for individuals with hearing and speech disabilities who use sign language. We know this because the FC launched our own ASL consumer support line in 2014. For the last 10 years, the FCC's ASL support line has allowed deaf and hard of hearing consumers to engage in direct interactive video calls with a consumer specialist at the FCC who can provide assistance in ASL for filing informal complaints and obtaining consumer information. The FCC's ASL support line called ACE Direct is based on an open source software code that enables direct video calling between businesses and government agencies and their customers and constituents using ASL over broadband facilities. In 2016, the commission hosted a showcase to demonstrate DVC and ACE Direct Information regarding ACE Direct and DVC generally and the video record of that ACE Direct showcase is available at the FCC's website at www.fcc.gov backslash DVC. To implement DVC, an organization or the agency needs to have the applicable consumer telephone numbers registered in the telecommunications relay services numbering directory with the associate, associated internet routing information for video phones. Both DVC and the video relay service, as well as enterprise video phones, rely on 10-digit North American numbering plan telephone numbers as the public-facing address. An enterprise video phone is a video phone maintained by an organization or government agency and designated for use by employees in private areas of the entity's premises. The numbers of all VRS users are registered in the TRS numbering directory. By registering an enterprise video phone number in the TRS numbering directory, an agency can establish a line that can be used for direct video calls from ASL users. Typically, when a VRS user, that is a video relay service user, dials an outbound call or receives an inbound call on a video phone registered in the directory, an ASL fluent communications assistant from the user's VRS provider will enter the call. However, if the VRS VRS user dials a number registered to a video phone in the numbering directory, like the AF FCC's ASL line, then the call is recognized as a point-to-point -point video call, and the user will be connected directly to the other party's video phone. Establishing DVC lines requires access to the TRS numbering directory, which was pre previously limited to TRS providers and the directory administrator. In 2017, the Commission authorized VTC Secure a DVC platform provider to provide DVC separately from relay services by granting it access to the TRS number and directory. At the time, the commission reasoned that allowing access to the directory would enable individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf, blind, or have a speech disability to move closer to obtaining the functional equivalency Congress envisioned in enacting Title IV of the Americans with Dis Disabilities Act. Title IV, also known as Section 225 of the Communications Act, 
requires telephone common carriers and their designees to provide TRS for individuals with hearing and speech disabilities so that they can access the public telephone system. The Commission observed that compared to traditional relay services, point-to-point -point services like TBC even more directly support the purposes of Section 225 because they increase the utility of the nation's telephone system for persons with hearing and speech disabilities by providing direct communications, including all the visual cues that are so important to persons with hearing and speech disabilities. As the next step in promoting DVC in 2019, the FCC amended its rules to allow entities designated as qualified direct video entities access to the directory in order to support direct communications between registered BRS users and customer support call centers. A qualified direct video entity is defined as an individual or entity that is engaged in direct video customer support and that is either the end user customer that has been assigned the telephone numbers used for direct video customer support or the designee of such entity. That definition can apply to an individual organization or agency that wants access to the directory to establish a DVC line or to a DVC platform vendor. In order to obtain authorization for access to the directory as a qualified direct video entity, an interested party must submit an application to the FCC's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau demonstrating that it understands the applicable responsibilities, including, for example, being able to transfer DVC calls to the user's VRS provider in case the user needs to talk to a hearing agent. CGB, in consultation with the Commission's Office of Manag Managing Director, will approve directory access if the applicant de demonstrates that it has a leg legitimate need for such access and is aware of its regulatory obligations. Qualified direct video entities directory access includes adding and deleting customer support telephone numbers and the associated routing information, conducting data queries to obtain routing information for outbound point-to-point -point video calls originating from, from such telephone numbers, conducting data queries to enable the transfer of an inbound direct video call to a VRS provided when needed, for example, to transfer a call to a hearing agent, and performing other necessary administrative functions such as ensuring protection of customer proprietary network information and interoperability with all VRS providers. Thus far, the Commission has pr approved four entities to provide DVC with directory access, NYZB, Communication Service for the Deaf, Inc., BTC Secure, and 360 Direct Video. The contact information for these companies is also available at the DVC website I mentioned earlier. So if there is no DVC, how do VRS users contact agency call centers? The principal other means of communication for this community are the various forms of TRS, including the video relay service or directly through text telephones or TTYs. It seems that many federal agencies still provide TTY numbers as a way for deaf and hard of hearing callers to reach their agencies. With a TTY to TTY call, a deaf or hard of hearing user texts conversation over a phone line to the other party on the call who receives the text over their TTY device and replies back by text. Parties on the call must take, take turns to communicate and follow a specific etiquette to facilitate the call. TTYs are decades old technology. They were designed for use on the switched copper network and are essentially useless on internet protocol based networks, which would include, for example, all major wireless networks which have already made the conversion to IP transmissions. While DVC cannot replace TTYs for those who do not know sign, sign language and need text communications, there are other modern text based forms of communication that have supplanted TTYs in general, and DVC can replace TTYs for ASL users. Use of TTYs has decreased significantly and generally would not be used by members of the deaf and hard hearing community with that, who, among those who have access to broadband internet services. So why implement DVC? By call volume, the two toll-free numbers dialed most frequently by VRS users are the two federal programs, the Social Security Administration and De Direct, Express, Direct Express, the Federal Benefits Debit Card. Both the, both the Social Security Administration and Direct Express numbers are dialed three or four times more frequently by VRS users than any of the other toll-free numbers in the top 10 dialed by VRS, VRS users. In 2023, 
Veto Relay Service users averaged 4,500 calls per month to the Social Security Administration, and those calls typically last 20 to 25 minutes. Also in 2023, VRS users averaged about 500 calls per month to the IRS and more during the spring tax season. Federal agencies interested in learning more about their VRS call volumes should contact the FCC's Disability Rights Office for more information at dvc at fcc.gov. So that's a brief introduction to, to DVC and the FCC's rules governing DVC. So now I'm going to turn the floor back to Susie for introduction of the next demonstration. Wow, I applaud you two. Very informative. Thank you both so much for sharing that information. And many of you may have some questions. We will have an opportunity for questions and answers. You can either come up approach if you're here with us in the room or online we have an email address live questions at fcc.gov please do send in your questions we will have an opportunity for q a at the end of each of the panels and we have two for now i'd like you to feel free to hold your questions and send them to our email address if you'd prefer but thank you again to Bill and Rachel for that very informative overview of DVC and the White House's executive orders. Very timely. So with that, you've heard a lot about DVC, but what is it? For some of you, you may have never seen it before. We will be providing a demonstration today. I'd like to say thank you to Ivy Bonheo, as well as Robert McConnell, they work with us here at the FCC in order to support the ASL consumer call line. So Ivy and Robert, would you join us at the table, please? Don't be shy. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert McConnell and telecommunication access specialist here at the FCC with the Disability Rights Office. And I'm a white male, 39, wearing a navy blue suit, green shirt, and a blue tie. And 10 years ago, the FCC hired me to actually start the direct video calling here at the Federal Communications Commission. And it's been a great journey these last 10 years. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Ivy. I'd like to introduce Ivy Banejo, who is my colleague. Thank you, Robert. Wow, 10 years. Uh, not even close to that. I am Ivy Banejo. I work in the FCC. I will hit three years this October, I believe, pretty soon. Visual description of myself, I'm a white woman, have brown hair pulled back in a ponytail with a green shirt and a gray blazer. Lovely to see you all here. Today we'd like to take an opportunity to provide a very brief demo of what direct video calling looks like through the FCC's ASL support line. This line was established June 2014 to allow deaf and hard of hearing consumers to engage and communicate directly with an agent of the FCC without a third party intermediary such as a relay service. With a communication specialist who can provide assistance with filling out informal complaints, providing additional information about FCC programming and services, and not only as it relates to disability work, but FCC-wide information, text to 911 calls, and others. Prior to 2014, ASL Fluent users could call using a third-party relay service and then connecting to the FCC. Since then, they've been able to connect and communicate with us directly. Open hours are Monday through Friday, 9.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And this call center is also integrated with the FCC's larger call center's ticketing system. And we use the 10-digit ticketing system, 888-4-FCC-ASL, or you can connect online through the website. DVC calls per year average over the last 10 years at 760 per year. However, over the last two years, we have received over 1,000 unique callers per year. 
With that, I'd like to show a brief demonstration of what a typical call looks like to the FCC ASL line. When an ASL fluent consumer calls into the FCC for assistance, this is what they see. And I'll explain briefly. What's happening now is the person who is calling in is typing in the phone number. Thank you for calling the FCC ASL support line. Please wait for the next available agent to assist you. Hello, FCC ASL Consumer Line here. How can I help you? Hi there. Finally, a direct video call in ASL with a federal agency. I'm calling because I subscribe to the FCC's Access Info Listserv, and I read something recently in May about $10 million to help Deaf-blind people? My close friend is deaf-blind and lives in Illinois. Where is the program? How can he get help? I'm happy to help. By the way, this program, the National Deaf-Blind Equipment Distribution Program, has another name. I can connect. And the URL is iCanConnect.org. This program is available to 56 states and territories. Go to the I Can Connect webpage and click on Contact My State and locate the program in Illinois. Oh, I see the Illinois program is in Chicago. And there's the contact information including a video phone number, so there's a way to call directly in ASL to the program, too. Can you give me the phone number? Sure, let me type the phone number for you. And now, uh, typing in the phone number, you'll see it appear in the chat momentarily. The agent is typing the number in now, 312-957-4865. Eligibility requirements and information about how to apply on the I Can Connect page, too. That's great information. What can the program do for eligible deaf blind individuals? A variety of distance communication equipment may be available depending on a person's specific needs, including braille devices, computers, mobile devices phones, signalers, accessories, and software. You can visit iCanConnect.org slash equipment to learn more about all the possible equipment that may be available. So again, the agent is now typing the URL and sharing it through the chat, I can connect dot org slash thank you so much this is such an easy way to get this information no problem thank you for contacting the FCC have a great day bye so that wraps our very short demo of what a call looks like more information about DVC implementation will be discussed during the panels today and following the panels at the exhibits. Thank you for coming today. Wonderful job. Thank you. Hello again. Thank you both. This is Susie speaking. Thank you both for providing that demonstration and all of the hard work you have provided 10 years celebrating a 10th anniversary with us. Some of you may be wondering more about iCanConnect.org. We do have flyers available here in the room, as well as braille materials at the same location. Feel free to pick up information. It includes an agenda, uh, more information surrounding this program. My apologies for not mentioning that earlier. If you would like a printed or braille copy of the agenda, we have that over um, on the table uh, just as you come into the room. With that, Next, we will be discussing the benefits of DVC. And we'd like to invite experts in the field to tell us what the benefits of DVC are. 
With that, I would like to invite our panelists to join us. As you can see, we have the names listed on the tables. First panel will be discussing the benefits of DVC. We have Zainab, Tia, Anne-Marie, and Tim. Tom, interpreter correction. For the deaf panelists, I will ask that you stand when signing in response so that those around the room can see you if you wouldn't mind. If you would prefer not to, please do feel free to sit, but it would be beneficial in order to maximize visibility. With that, we have heard so much about DVC, rules, requirements, and seen a demonstration. We'd now like to hear from you, consumers and industry, on what are the benefits of DVC. We'll go ahead and do a round of introductions. Please do very briefly describe yourselves and what your relationship is with DVC. And with that, I'll start with you, Zainab. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Zainab el Kipsi, and this is how you say my name in ASL. I represent the National Association of the Deaf, NAD, and I'm their policy counsel. Visual description is that I'm an Arab American woman in my late 30s with black curly shoulder length hair and glasses and a black dress and a houndstooth blazer. Now, in terms of our organization's relationship with DVC, our organization has advocated for direct access to DVC for quite some time, and I'll go into more detail about that later. Good afternoon. I'm Anne Marie Killian, and this is how you say my name in ASL. I am a white woman wearing a blue blazer, glasses, brown hair, shoulder length. And I'm with TDI for Access. I'm the CEO. And since 1968, I've been advocating for access and inclusion within the field of technology. And I've been involved strongly with the FCC and collaborating with other organizations to advocate for policy. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Wonderful to be here with my colleagues on this panel. My name is Bobby Cordano. I'm president of Gallaudet University. My uh, visual description, I have brown hair. I'm a white woman. I have blue glasses, and I'm wearing a purple jacket. And uh, I'm not going to share with my age. Suffice to say, I'm older than most people on this panel, so I'll leave it at that. My connection to DVC is uh, just the two examples you saw here with I Ivy and Robert. Uh, we are very connected to experimenting with DVC, uh, and you saw what our alumni can do as graduates of Gallaudet and how we can contribute with our bilingual graduates and our commitment to the use of American Sign Language in all aspects of our lives. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Tia Dole. I am the Chief 988 Officer. I am a black woman wearing an unintentionally in a patriotic shirt um, that is red, white, and blue. Um, and I'm the Chief 988 Officer, which means that I'm the administrator of the National Suicide uh, Hotline. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Lidkowski, Vice President of Accessibility at Comcast. Um, wearing, uh, I'm a white male, uh, long hair, no, just kidding, no hair, uh, and uh, a s uh, blazer and button-down shirt. Uh, so as the uh, Vice President of Accessibility at Comcast, my job is to um, s guide and set the vision for how the company can create and deploy and drive adoption of inclusive customer and employee facing experiences. And uh, we started a direct video calling uh, service in 2019 and looking forward to talking more about that as we move through the panel. Thank you, distinguished panelists. Truly appreciate your introductions. We'll begin with our first question and we'll begin with Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, what are the benefits of DVC? especially coming from TDI, 
working very closely with the deaf community. What have you heard that you can share with us regarding the benefits of DVC? That's a good question. Making sure I've got the interpreter all lined up, I'll make sure to sign slowly. So our role is really focusing on communication and technology, ICT. And so we're listening to the community about their experiences, but I'd like to take it back in time just a little bit. We recognize that technology is an evolving thing, and we used to have TTYs, which were mentioned by Bill, and a lot of TTYs were cumbersome because they would take time and it would require a third party to facilitate the communication, but that technology is obsolete at this point, and it has been for quite some time. There are still a small percentage of people that do use TTYs, but VRS has come onto the scene, and VRS is quite important, and it is an available resource that's important to the community, and we receive feedback from the community, and we represent those individuals as a part of the community that use American Sign Language to communicate. And often there's misunderstanding be from providers of services, whether that's government, industry, medical, or health, receiving information because the primary language is ASL, but it's provided in English. And captioning is not sufficient to be able to facilitate that communication, even though providers may feel that it is. And ASL is, in fact, a different language that it does different grammatical structure from English. And so I'd also like to add a personal anecdote of my own. Uh, I was raised oral, and I learned ASL when I was 15 years old, so my first language is English. Now, my husband, my other half, his first language is ASL, and we interact with, the, uh, with each other, and he will often ask me to help him advocate for services. Even though he's using the VRS service, he still struggles to get what he needs and communicate what he needs. And so we both have to work together to be able to understand what's going on in any given context or service. In this specific situation, we were struggling because there was internet issues during COVID and we kept having internet go out. And we were trying to figure out what was going on with those daily briefings that were coming from the White House as other news outlets during the pandemic. And unfortunately, we were having difficulty with our internet. So we called our internet provider and we actually got a deaf agent, which was something that was unexpected. And so the deaf agent connected, and it looked very much like the demo we just saw here a few minutes ago. And I was still processing what is actually was happening at that moment, having a deaf agent to help me with my issue. And so my husband was able to sign an ASL to the agent and explain exactly what was going on. And I know enough about technology to be dangerous, but I'm certainly no expert when it comes to technology. And he was relying on me to resolve a technical issue, which was uh, quite the issue. So. They recognized that we needed to uh, escalate to tier two support, and the tier two support agent was also deaf, which was quite impressive. And so that was awesome that we're able to solve that issue and go into great detail and assign the concepts using American Sign Language, not relying on English text. And that's important. And we live in a world where we're searching for independence and point-to-point -point communication. And so I'd like to emphasize that providers, other industry. VRS is important, it does have a place, but you just have to think about our language and providing independence and accessibility to be able to make those connections. So, also the Disability Advisory Committee in 2023 implemented a lot of recommendations that would benefit with DVC, meaning quality, independence, language, and communication, and all of those things are important. And the FCC recognizes and agrees that a lot of federal agencies still are using TTYs as the way to reach the customer service, but not many people are relying on that. However, they do need access to the government service, whether that's the SSA, Social Security Administration, IRS with tax issues. They're often going through VRS, and again, it is beneficial, but we want consumers to be able to have choice in their communication and choice of language that they're using. And so that's the benefit of direct video calling. Wow, thank you so much. This is Susie. Thank you so much for that perspective, Anne-Marie, on the importance of DVC and the importance of having options in DVC. I'd now like to turn it over to uh, those who help operate the Consumer Service Center, or call center, to tell us a bit more about what you've heard on that side of things. We'll begin first with Tom. Thank you. So, oh, 
in 2019, uh, we launched our first uh, uh, ASL call center direct video calling uh, service. Uh, and it supported our Internet Essentials program, which is our program that enables uh, broadband connectivity for uh, low-income low uh, uh, individuals in our service area, households in our service area. Uh, and uh, it was a pilot. And we partnered with uh, Communication Service for the Deaf at the time. And uh, we wanted to see how that would work and what type of feedback we got. And we gradually expanded to other services. Uh, billing was one. Uh, tech support was another. Um, and so it's actually pretty uh, exciting to hear you know, Zainab's story about the, the value in, in when the internet goes out, it can be very uh, alarming, disarming. Um, obviously, uh, individuals are using video phones, and if the internet isn't there, uh, then you know people want to know or you need information about something happening externally. Uh, and so in this case, um, our agents can, th they're un universal agents today, fast forward to today, um, we serve about 2,000 to 3,000 calls a month, um, and our agents are generally universal agents, so they can help with repair uh, and support um, and, you know, account uh, troubleshooting, whatever it might be, um, both from a technical and non-technical standpoint. And uh, the testimonials that we get from individuals are, are incredible. We literally have had uh, people put the call on hold for a second, bring their spouse and family members around their video phone, and we've had people, you know, you know, tear up because this access was, uh, you know, really caught them by surprise. And so what we did is we were able to work with our partner to register um, a few of our most popular 1-800 toll-free numbers into the video phone uh, ITRS database. And so now if somebody calls on a video phone, 1-800-XFINITY, for example, uh, through a video phone, they will directly connect to our deaf communications, uh, uh, our deaf uh, customer service agents. That was really critical for us because, you know, if we were going to make this better than video relay, we had to really look at how to reduce all of the barriers to entry and by having this direct connection was, was critical. We also have a button on the website, so you can go to uh, xfinity.com slash ASL, and uh, there is a button uh, there that's labeled ASL Now, and you can click that button and uh, immediately connect to an agent. So we wanted to make sure that we were as inclusive as possible, that we supported video phones, and that we supported web access. And then from the video phone side, um, if the ASL call center uh, is uh, called after hours, um, we do uh, direct customers in terms of how to transfer out to a relay service. And even during operating hours, we also uh, allow customers to opt out of the direct video calling and go to a relay service if they prefer. Um, I believe at last check, uh, at least the last check that I did of the data, uh, somewhere around 2% or less uh, of those calling into our uh, direct video calling center actually opted to conduct their business with Comcast through, through a relay service. And then, again, the testimonials are uh, just unbelievable. Um, you know, in terms of time spent and being efficient, um, you know, we had one customer tell us that he was trying to move his service address across town, and something that would have taken him, uh, you know, maybe an hour or more through a relay service took him 15 or 20 minutes, which is probably just around the same amount of time that it would take for a hearing caller uh, to interact with us uh, to, to, uh, to do the same uh, function of, of requesting a, a service address change. So that's, that's been our experience. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, watching this grow as we expand to uh, support other products. Uh, we would expect that our agents will uh, be trained in those, in those areas as well.
Thank you so much, Tom. Susie here. See some hands waving applause in the audience, some clapping as well. Thank you for that. I'd like to turn it over to Tia next. And before I do so, I was reading somewhere that 988 now has approximately 10 million calls annually. So um, we launched 988 in July of 2022. I hope everybody knows what it is. It's a national suicide hotline. You dial 988 to get 24 hour service. Um, since we've launched, we've served more than 10 million people. Um, and so when you ask the question, you know, what is, what is the, the uh, benefit of di direct video calling? When an individual is in crisis, people need to be served in the language of their choice. It's sort of a non-negotiable. Um, and in particular, when someone is thinking about suicide, the idea of using a translating service or even typing for some individuals can be incredibly triggering. And so from our perspective at, at 988 and, and with SAMHSA, we thought that it was incredibly important to change our services um, and to do video calling. And so we launched in September. So I'll say, um, I thought about, well, what is the benefit? Because there's about 400 benefits, but what are my top three? Um, number one, people in crisis are served quickly in their native language um, with folks who have a sense of their identity and, and lived experience. Number two, um, the benefit of employing individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing and creating an entire workforce of folks who want to serve their community is, is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I would say is it's about storytelling. Uh, if you do a little bit of research on suicide in the deaf and hard of hearing uh, community, you find like one article. Um, there is very little storytelling and information and research being conducted with suicide in the deaf and hard of hearing com uh, community. With 988 serving people with video phone, what you're doing is, is you're allowing people's voices to be heard across the network. And so um, we've served about 30,000 people since September. Um, and we anticipate that number going up. And so, um, you know, we're deeply committed to it. And, you know, uh, at the beginning of this, you said, well, we have um, some experts sitting here. I am not the expert. Everybody else on this panel is the expert. I just happen to be the lucky one to be able to provide the service. Thank you so much, Tia. And thank you, Tom, also, for the numbers are very impressive. Imagining the benefits of continuing to deploy and make this available everywhere. Thank you for shining a light on that. The numbers really are there. The need is there. So with that in mind, oh, sorry, I should stand. With that in mind, this next question is, given that ASL is the third most commonly used language in the United States, following English and Spanish, what should agencies and organizations know about this population? If they would like to establish a DVC line, what should they know about this population? We'll begin first with Zainab. Sure, thank you. I'd like to talk about the concept of language equity. A lot of people tend to assume that ASL is based on English, just like Anne Marie was saying earlier, and that's not the case. They are not related. ASL is completely separate language from English. It has its own syntax and grammatical structure. So for agencies or companies to say that they provide TTYs and therefore they are accessible and that is sufficient, that's not actually the case. TTYs are not just obsolete, as Anne Marie mentioned, but they're also based on English and telling the deaf person that they need, but they're telling a deaf person who relies on ASL that they need to communicate in English, which is their second language. And the NAD has been advocating for years on direct access for ASL to be done because that is the native language of deaf people. And there are organizations who have been advocating with the FCC for direct access, along with 988. And I'm thrilled to see that 988 is providing ASL service. And as Tia just mentioned, people in crisis often have to then communicate in English, and they are already going through a difficult time, and then through a third party adds to the trauma that they're experiencing. 
We've also been advocating for direct access with federal agencies. And the NAD often gets questions and contacts from consumers about why different federal agencies don't have a direct hotline. For example, the DOJ, IRS, Social Security. Uh, as we just saw earlier, uh, federal agencies have a high volume of VRS calls. And deaf people want to be able to interact and engage with an agent using their own native language just like a hearing person is able to do and so that they can express whatever their need or concern is and have their situation resolved in a timely fashion. And that doesn't just benefit the deaf consumer with the specific need that they have, but it also benefits the employment. As President Bobby Guarana was saying, she's gonna talk a little bit more about this, but it would help to be able to increase employment for deaf and hard of hearing people. And so the point of providing direct video calling will help to advance the experience for deaf and hard of hearing people. And it will help to increase job opportunities and advance the experience of direct access in ASL to provide effective communication. And being able to communicate directly is effective communication. And that person is able to interact directly rather than having to go through a third party. And VRS is an important option to have. It's an important service that needs to exist for our community. But DVC should also be offered as an option. Consumer choice is the priority here. Let the person choose how they would like to communicate, whether that is direct or through a relay service. It's important that they have as many options as possible. And agencies or companies that only offer one choice, which might be TTY, or the use of a relay service, is not truly providing access. And the federal experience should mirror what Comcast and 988 are providing. And the FCC has, is also a fantastic model. They've had their ASL line for 10 years now, and as they've mentioned, it's been quite a journey. And we've had a lot of consumers contact us at the NAD and tell us that they were able to resolve their issue by being able to communicate with the FCC directly in ASL. And they wish that they had more experiences like that. So we want to see this become deployed all across the federal agencies that exist. And I'd like to emphasize again how direct access is more efficient and allows for more timely resolution of issues in your native expression of language. You don't have to worry about the language that's being used or being routed through a third party, which often takes more time and lends itself to misunderstanding and miscommunication. And so the point is that we strongly encourage the federal agencies that are here in the audience today to implement direct video calling and your respective agencies to be able to bring us closer to the functional equivalence for deaf and hard of hearing people. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. Round of applause, waving hands here for you as well. Now I'll turn it over to Bobby. Would you like to add? Well, first, I just want to acknowledge my colleagues seated here on the panel with me. Thank you for your wonderful comments that have been shared thus far. I'm quite impressed, I have to say. I think the argument has already been presented, why DVC is so important, but I would like to add some additional thoughts today. You know, I would like to present uh, the notion of language equity as a framework to add to Zainab's comments. You know, many federal agencies do provide services in Spanish and other spoken languages, and American Sign Language does not receive the same quality in terms of equity with other spoken languages that are able to access these federal agencies. Now we see here with examples from Comcast and 988, just the value that they provide to ASL and increasing in the quality of services that's provided as a result of that. So we're seeing that here with the FCC and the work that's being done here. We see the value of DVC. And I would say, as president of Gallaudet University, we also value, we value the equity of both English and American Sign Language at our university. And this is part of our story, how we value both languages, and in doing so, we see success for the deaf community, and they're able to thrive as a result. So that's a frame I use in sharing my comments to you about the value of American Sign Language and the service provision provided to the deaf community. 
Secondly, as president of Gallaudet University, I'm responsible for providing employment opportunities for deaf graduates, some of whom you have seen here. I've already mentioned Ivy and Robert, others who are here as well. I'm sure through the services that are provided here through Comcast and 988 and the FCC, we see many deaf alumni from Gallaudet being able to find job opportunities. I can share with you that DVC is an employment, um, important employment opportunity for many individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing and hearing, not everyone has to be deaf. But the importance of this is around the fact that we are adding opportunities for deaf people to join the workforce. I mean, if you think about it, DVC is not taking away jobs from anyone else, but rather it's additive in nature, providing more job, job opportunities to the workforce in the United States. And we know that opportunities are so important to people in the community in the United States. We owe these opportunities to individuals who can bring skills and talent using American Sign Language to the workforce, which is a valuable skill. And that's part of the language equity framework that I bring. It's around the value of American Sign Language that can be brought to to the workforce that are brought by individuals who are fluent in that language. And we at Gallaudet University want to see that, that uh, value enhanced even further. Thirdly, as an institution that trains interpreters at the undergraduate, masters, and PhD level, we have experienced the long runway it takes to produce high quality interpreters that are needed in the VRS industry. And we are experiencing a shortage of interpreters across the country. And all of the interpreting demands we have, not just through VRS, but in the workforce, the community, and public service, it's a serious issue. So the runway is so long that we're unable to meet that demand readily. And one of the solutions to this is DVC. DVC adds to the choices that are available for our community through providing government and agency services access to direct communication for deaf people. So this, again, doesn't discount the interpreters that we have. We certainly need interpreters to provide access to spoken English. But once again, this is an added service that offers further choices and, again, represents employment opportunities that otherwise not available to others who are deaf, but it provides opportunities for people who are deaf, hard of hearing, and hearing as well, and adding jobs through the workforce as a result of DVC. And last but certainly not least, you know we've heard about the mandate to increase the number of people with disabilities who are working for the federal government. We have actually seen some of the latest statistics of declining numbers of deaf people working in the federal government. As president of Gallaudet, I can certainly tell you that I think DVC has the possibility to be an entryway for many government positions, not just to only be DVC positions, but an opportunity for people to have the door opened and then from there go on to other federal agencies seeking employment pathways so that deaf people can thrive within the federal government. I certainly encourage the federal government to expand and to be a model for the rest of the country, showing the value of American Sign Language, the value of hiring people who use sign language, and the value of direct access and consumer choice. Thank you. Amazing, and seeing so many benefits that have been identified and shared today. Thank you so much. This is Susie. And we will also be accepting questions now. We do have a few questions. I would like to share a global perspective after hearing everyone's comments, an observation. It is summertime. I'm sure many of us use bridges driving to the beach. I'm thinking of the Bay Bridge in particular. And how efficient it can be to get where you need to go. Not draw bridges. You're not relying on anyone else to connect you to the next body of land, the place you're trying to go. Much like people, we are trying to connect to one another through a bridge. We need to think about the options for individuals to be able to communicate with one another, whether it is a quick autonomous bridge, something you can cross independently, or a drawbridge in which it requires assistance, or even a ferry that is pulled manually by a cable. Those do exist throughout the world. We do need to modernize our communication. So when we are talking about TTYs, that is still an option, but it is not an option that federal agencies should be reliant upon. We have seen many federal agencies out there still advertise TTY as the only option in direct communication for the deaf community. 
That's something to think about, a bridge that we would like to build in the 21st century. With that, we'll start our question period. Uh, if anyone would like to ask questions in the room, uh, we have one through the live questions email, but would anyone in the room like to ask your questions? Please feel free to raise your hands. We'll get started. Oh, before that, so we'll begin with the online question we have received. We have received one question through livequestions at FCC.gov. The question asks, what do we do with senior citizens when they are not savvy about leveraging DVC? How do we support that population? I guess I'll open it up to our panelists. Tia, around 988, Bobby. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, in terms of um, the older population, we actually haven't done any direct work trying to address their population. What I will say is that um, one of the biggest challenges with DVC and 988 is the lack of resources in the community. 988 is a connector, right? So when people call us, they're usually in crisis. And after they speak to us, our, our, the intention is that we connect them with local services. So I assume other folks on the panel can speak to this, but there is a significant dearth of local resources that we can send individuals who reach out to us. And so realistically speaking, what we're facing in 988 is an inability to help specialized populations within the, within the deaf and hard of hearing communities because local communities are actually significantly lacking. So I'll, I'm very curious to see what other folks on the panel have to say. Well, I'm curious if you'd like to share first, Anne Marie or others, you have some direct uh, experience perhaps? I'm happy to respond, thank you, that's a great question. At NAD, and again, I'm not speaking for any of the other panelists, NAD does not state that TTYs themselves must be completely removed from the situation. We do recognize that they are still very popular and still relied upon, especially for senior citizens who oftentimes prefer to stay with what they know and what they're comfortable with and not interested in trying new technology. That's okay. Deafblind individuals, individuals who live in rural areas, TTYs should still be an option available to them, but at the same time, DVC should also be provided as an option for those who would so choose to use it. For federal agencies to say, we provide TTYs and that is adequate. We don't agree. We would like to see the addition of DVC. It provides an important service, uh, it funds the economy, it can relate to health, public benefits, deaf and hard of hearing people have questions, they have needs, they need to contact your agencies just as hearing people do. Make sure you are available for them to reach you in whatever methods they prefer. With that, I will turn it over to Bobby and Marie. Well, first, I just wanted to check on some of the assumptions that may be within that question. As someone who had a mother who was elderly, uh, you know, many deaf people are early adopters of technology. And we have been using technology for a long time. I mean, if you look at many of our senior citizens who are deaf, chances are very likely that they will have some fluency, at least sufficiently enough to be able to use DVC. So I wanna make sure that we uh, <coughs> check assumptions that may be built into that question. Secondly, yes, indeed, there are some senior citizens who may struggle a bit. I do commend Tom's uh, testimony as he shared as to how easy it is to make it for people to be able to just simply press a button on the website. So ease of connection is critical here. We should look for varying models that show that ease and make it available easily. If you have to go through multiple pages, that's gonna make it very overwhelming and difficult. Now, for many senior citizens, I can add as well, communication in American Sign Language actually makes it easier for them they actually will commit themselves to getting to the point to talk to someone. Very often they rely upon their children to help them access, but having direct access allows them to be independent to do this on their own. Many older citizens have family members and friends who do help them, and they've been in that supportive role. I've done that myself for deaf adults. But the key here is to provide access and make it available, but it's also important to allow people to have the independence to resolve issues on their own. If they can communicate directly in American Sign Language, it's actually more effective. 
because if English is their second language or third language at that, uh, it becomes even harder as you get older to be able to navigate those varying languages. Communication in AXL is so much uh, more clear for them. So thank you, it's a very important question to ask. Effective communication, it's very important. <laughs> Susie here, I did want to add to that comment. And the FCC's ASL line has many different types of calls, many different types of callers. Some don't even sign as fluently. That's where we utilize other features, such as the chat function. We try to be creative in supporting everyone who calls in via video, even if they may not be fluent in ASL. Deafblind individuals who contact us, they have asked, what about us? The response to that is, we will support you. We will need to schedule an appointment to do so, but we will provide DVC for deafblind consumers as well. Perhaps if they have a, an SSP, a CDI, having someone in their home to provide that service, we will work out those details in advance. And that is something federal agencies can do. We can support a variety of callers using DVC as well. And with that, I believe we have one question from a member of the audience. Can you come join us over here? So that we'll have you in camera view. And please introduce yourself and ask your question. Good afternoon, my name is Eugenio Revelo Mendoza. And I'm wearing all black and a bracelet and salt and pepper hair with glasses. Uh, Latino, 40s in age and male. Sorry, I forgot that part. All right, so I'll try to be concise with my question here. As a new American and someone that is deafblind and has ADHD, my experience with communicating with airlines and airports has been overwhelming. Often it's via text, which is troublesome. And I know that this is going to be more widespread available as time goes on, but I recently had an issue and there was no backup plan. And I know this question might be difficult for these panelists to answer, but I'm wondering if the FCC is going to urge other agencies to establish a plan for the deployment. And in regards to that question, uh, where there be any kind of logo or anything that will be established that will be a universal way of knowing that there is this type of communication available because such a logo exists for TTYs and Braille and other types of communications. Also like Gallaudet University has the logo for video phones which is very general, the use of a sign for a camera, but a logo for DVC that is unique, kind of like Apple has their iconic logo and you know where when you're at an Apple store. So I'm just wondering if something like that would be implemented as a part of DVC programming. And then the third part of my question is I was asking if the FCC would be reaching out to other agencies and if so, what the timeline on that would be because I'm a new American and I know that there are about a thousand people from Venezuela who have been contacting me through Instagram who have emigrated to the United States and a lot of them have questions about how to complete paperwork through USCIS for the green card and permanent residency. And I know that there's an in-person interpreting need which is an issue and DVC might be great as an option for that, but it does require a lot of explanation and they might not even know what the concept of DVC is, but if there was a logo to be established that was universally understood, not a digit, a 10 digit phone number, not a URL, but a logo. I'm a linguist and so I think that a picture is more iconic and more easily accessible to people of diverse backgrounds to be able to understand because they might be in different regional locations within the United States coming from various different countries into the US. And I think for the DVC to be able to be effective, there needs to be some kind of logo to access the service. Thank you, and I'll wait for him to sit. This is Susie here, three questions. First question posed is regarding the FCC, and will the FCC encourage my apologies, I know the second question was regarding logo, third question was regarding um, people immigrating to the United States. The first question? Will the FCC take an active role in reaching out to other agencies to implement DVC? 
Thank you, I appreciate it. What are we doing to get the word out? We are doing this as an example of some of the things we're doing. We are walking the walk as we talk the talk. DVC's page at dvc.fcc.gov, you will see a list of federal agencies that have already implemented an ASL line. So take a look there. If you don't see them listed there, reach out to them and ask. Ask whether or not they would like to add themselves to that list. As for a logo, mm, that is a good suggestion. We will look into that. I don't know if anyone else wanted to add. I know he mentioned Gallaudet having some sort of logo in place. I would like to say that iconology is something that is very important for uh, con the emergency space context. Who is that? I was just looking to see if Aaron Kuby was here with us in the room. He is from FEMA and understands the importance of having a way to make communication expedient and clear in times of crisis. So perhaps having an icon, a logo, a symbol for such things. Would any of the panelists like to add anything? We do agree that DVC supports effective communication during a crisis. You know, I would like to take a moment to recognize you, Susie, and your leadership and your work here at the FCC. The chairwoman Rosen Wurzel was here, and I wanted to thank her as well for her leadership. You know, I just, we, I had the privilege to meet with her not that long ago, and we talked about the importance of DVC in that meeting. I think the fact that this hearing is happening here is a great example of D the FCC's commitment, not just to encouraging federal agencies to use it, but really to be a model for others as well. How we can distribute this more broadly and show models of success that exist. What I'm hearing today are some great stories of success that can be shared, and that's what will influence other federal agencies even more. I also would say when we see what the deaf community is asking for, even today through the questions, immigration services and other services as well, these are things we may not have thought about where it is important to focus and prioritize the use of DVC. But I did want to acknowledge FCC for their leadership, their experimentation and doing this as a model to show why this works and why it's so important. Thank you. It's a community effort. Thank you. Zainab? Yes. So the three of us, President Cordona, Anne Marie, and I, actually met with the chairwoman, Rosen Ruschel, uh, and it was not just that long ago. I think it was, what, about a month ago? Maybe three weeks ago, a month ago? And this event is already happening just three or four weeks later. And we talked about it being a good idea to having this type of event, and she liked the idea, and she wanted to encourage this type of DVC type event, but within a month, here it is, and it's happening, and all of you are present. So I'd just like to add to Bobby's comments about the chairwoman, and what she's done, what the FCC has done, and what the DRO has done. And all of our panelists as well. It takes a village, we know that. So thank you all for making this happen. And we have our next question. Next question is, what platforms are available if federal agencies would like to implement DVC? At fcc.gov slash DVC, you'll find a white paper there that contains a list of qualified direct, oh, sorry, one moment, qualified direct video entities. And these qualified direct video entities are out there if you would like to encourage your staff. We here at the FCC, uh, are interested in very many different options. So that lists a number of options from hiring a QVDE or having your own staffing. Now, platform options vary as well. There's a wide variety there. Tom, Tia, would you like to add on the potential options? I think, you know, again, uh, in our case, we partnered. This I'm is sorry, Tom. One moment. Okay. Sorry. In our case, Hi, this is Tom. Uh, in, you know, in our case, uh, you know, we we partnered with a, a vendor, uh, you know, uh, today CSD to to handle the platform issues for us, um, and uh, you know, so I think it, it really comes down to in our in our case, you know, partnering with the in infrastructure, uh, and then they're also uh, handling the employment of the agents. So our call center is uh, you know indirectly employing you know between 15 and, and 20 plus uh, individuals from the deaf community um, but the platform is really uh, done through them so we, we view our vendor in this case is uh, how we would view a, 
a third party call center, right? They go through our trainings, uh, then they train the teammates that are going to support the calls and the service. Uh, and then the same holds true with the infrastructure uh, to make sure that we can, you know, uh, get in, get into the ITRS, get our numbers into the ITRS. And, you know, obviously certain security protocols need to be met with the platform because we may be taking, you know, personal information, credit card information, things of that nature. Uh, and so um, that's how our organization, our customer care organization felt uh, most comfortable at the time. Um, we use CSD um, and you know we can't make a recommendation for which one to use. We have we have some limitations with, with CSD related to being a call center that does active rescues, meaning that we um, uh, you know dispatch emergency services to folks at home. And our other limitation with CSD is actually um, people who misuse the line um, and um, you know our abusive callers who are not actually people in crisis. And so those are those are our sort of limitations with it. But that's our platform currently. Bobby? Sure. You know, I just wanted to share something a bit more broadly here. We have an example of, of FEMA here. FEMA is actually collaborating with one of our programs. It's a master's in international development. And in that program, we're able to train and educate students about disaster relief efforts and support that can be provided. And we're seeing a pipeline of our students going into FEMA and the operating the DVC line. So one of the things that's also possible is to think about training our students while they're at Gallaudet, getting their undergraduate or graduate degree programs to also get the quality of training out there, offering a certificate maybe in specific areas pertinent to an agency, and then partnering with the DVC service providers to be able to bring qualified people to the workforce. Wow, and the questions keep coming in. It's great. We do have a bit of time left. Hopefully time for a few more questions. The next is, in the next panel, we'll talk more about technology and the technological aspects of deploying DVC. Michael Scott will go into greater depth with that in that panel. Perhaps that could, this next question could be answered by the second panel as well. And this question is chatbots. We have chatbots here in the 21st century. How does that function integrate with DVC, and how do you envision the use of DVC with chatbots to make chatbots more accessible? Any thoughts on that? Yes, I am happy to comment on chatbots. First of all, there have been a lot of studies and research that's been done by one group hashtag deaf safe AI. And there's been a lot of discussion about chatbots replacing or instead of the use of ASL. But that goes back to the point that all of us panelists have been trying to emphasize. Chatbots are English based. And so you're talking about text. So that's one thing. And then AI today, we recognize that it's something that is emerging. We do recognize that. And we know that there are providers that are already looking into the use of AI to be able to supplement what's being provided, possibly even American Sign Language through AI. But we're not there yet. One day, maybe. But chatbots are not a replacement for DVC. Not today, maybe in the future. But again, that goes back to the purpose of the DVC, is to provide that functional equivalence for individuals to be able to use American Sign Language. And that's the important use of that visual language. We have a long way to go before we're able to do anything else like that. Because we need to feed in a lot of data to get data sets and algorithms that will be able to support automated use of interpreters or automated use of ASL, and we're just not there yet. And so we may be able to use chatbots one day, but I don't see that being feasible, feasible right now. And I would like to caution providers that you need to weigh the impacts on uh, causing undue harm on this community, because we do see that happening in regards to communication, and so I would like you to be mindful of that. And I can speak just from a perspective of developing AI related to American Sign Language. This is an area that's going to require a whole lot of investment. You know what, we're going to see people talking about AI and sign language, and they think there are some examples of robots that sign or, you know, text to sign. 
But in fact, there's a lot of ASL apps right now that are trying to convert ASL to text or text ASL, but they're all based on algorithms that are tied to English. Many of them are based in maybe just one particular sign after the next sign, still based in English word order, English syntax, and the technology is unable to capture the subtleties of the language. The important aspects of American Sign Language grammar is not able to be captured by the technology. And that's gonna take some time before we get to develop to that level. The technology that's available now is still developing, and it's much more English-based. And then they bring in a deaf signer to try and add something on to what they already have, but there's a still a long way to go. What we're looking at is to see how we can have AI with us and not without us when it comes to the use of sign language. Amen. And that's a larger issue for us in the deaf community. Um, I'd actually like to speak to this um, per pertaining to 988. We will not have chat box on 988. Um, uh, the only way that we would use not, uh, AI is actually to support um, the counselor um, offering resources during the course of the call or offering um, you know, feedback to the way that the counselor is engaging with the individual, the individual will not be interacting with machine learning as long as I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. And Erin from FEMA would like to add a comment to that. Hello, everyone. I'm Erin Kuby and I work for FEMA, Communication Access Specialist, as well as a certified deaf interpreter. I'm on a light blue shirt, salt and pepper hair and beard, blue glasses. And I wanted to quickly add to Bobby's comment that she recently made. One thing that people think about ASL is that it's signing, but you have to think about the facial expressions that are part of the grammatical structure of the language as well. And as AI has mentioned by Anne Marie, it's just not there yet. You might have the signing aspect of it, but you're still missing the non-manuals and the facial expressions, the tone, the inflection, all of those other components of the language. And so that can't be replaced at this point. DVC, direct video calling, does allow for that holistic experience and that functional equivalence for communication. This is Susie. Thank you for adding that, Erin. Thank you. And to all our panelists as well, I think we could talk about AI all day, even just that single topic. It's a very interesting one. And chat bar bots are show using ASL in some places. I'm seeing that. We see it coming. It is something to look at, how we could potentially integrate that. So thank you for that question and comments to that question. We have time for about one more question, and then we will break for five minutes and return for the second panel. Next question for this panel to discuss the benefits on is what does a caller do or a call center do if a caller calls in and needs to be transferred to a more experienced individual? It may have been Tom or it may have been Anne Marie that mentioned that needing to be escalated to a tier two representative. How would it work in that situation? Does the call center have the option to transfer to interpreter correction? Does the caller have the option to be transferred? And as Bill shared earlier, it is required for DVC lines to have the option for VRS if that is what's preferred. So that's a short answer to that question, but if any of our panelists would like to add anything. Yes, this is Tom. After Anne Marie, please. Okay, counter, counter. Thank you. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Anne Marie. No, go ahead, Tom. You can oh. go ahead and go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, we got to figure out how AI can help the blind understand when somebody's speaking on the other side and sign. We'll figure that out. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, let's see. So, so for us, you have to think of our ASL call center as an actual call center, right? Uh, where uh, a, a call centers would have, you know, tier one agents, tier two. Um, it's all in how we work with our vendor and train uh, the agents, right? And so uh, that transfer happens within the call center. In our case, Comcast also uh, supports a, uh, what we call our accessibility call center. And that's the call center that uh, has 75 plus agents, close to 100 agents today. And our ASL call center, which I described earlier as a third-party call center works in partnership or in tandem 
with our accessibility call center, which is uh, internal to Comcast. And so there might be times where uh, there could be some behind the scenes conversations happening uh, between those agents or um, this uh, di uh, direct video calling center could also call back out to uh, customers. Uh, so if there was a question that came up that perhaps uh, couldn't be answered, uh, then the uh, vendor would go, CSD in this case, would go back to our our, our accessibility call center and in through our, uh, you know, our customer uh, knowledge management system and, and be able to, you know, reach back to the customer. But in general, in general, uh, think about uh, as you consider maybe setting one of these up, whatever your call center has in it for hearing uh, customers or uh, you would you would want that same uh, equivalent in the ASL call center, except instead of two hearing agents, there might be two deaf agents, one being a tier one, one being a tier two, and that training is coming from us, our trainers, to the vendor in whatever uh, verticals that we have them supporting. So whether it's billing, tech support, internet support, internet essentials, as I mentioned earlier, those trainings are specific. Uh, where they might have specific cues for hearing callers. In this case, we're bringing all of those cues under one roof because it's all a specialized cue for ASL. Thank you so much, Tom. Susie here. I see some hands waving in the audience as well. Uh, we do need to wrap this panel. Uh, to keep things to schedule. And the next panel will be meeting in five minutes. So you have five minutes to get up, walk around, stretch. We have restrooms located directly outside those doors. Please do return at 2.30. And I'd like to thank all of the panelists for your amazing contributions to our understanding of DVC. Round of applause. Hello, everyone. We're getting ready to get started. If you could please take your seats, gather around. We have another exciting panel getting ready to start. OK, if everyone would return, please, we'll begin our second panel. We had a nice quick break. Now we have a full afternoon, and my apologies, we weren't able to provide a longer break. But following 3.20, we will have an opportunity for you to go about the room, mingle, take a look at the exhibits. So you will have time to network with one another. Thank you for returning for the remainder of the program. This is now the second panel, which will be led by Michael Scott, Deputy Chief of the Disability Rights Office to discuss how to deploy DVC. They will also be accepting questions following the end of their panel. Please do hold your questions or send them to livequestions at FCC.gov. You may also sign them here in the room. With that, I'd like to welcome Michael to continue on with the second panel. Thank you. All right. I want to make sure I did that right. Thank you. Oh. Just get that microphone adjusted. Just, there we go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Scott. I am the Deputy Division Chief in the Disability Rights Office and the Consumer and Governmental, Affair Bureau, uh, Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau at the FCC. I am a white male with short brown hair wearing a gray suit and a blue shirt and a square pattern tie. I had to figure out whether it was a square pattern or a check pattern today. I, and I believe I found that out correctly. So we're very excited to welcome you to our second panel, which is how can a federal agency implement DVC? And I have some wonderful, wonderful panelists to introduce you to today to this, discuss this question from federal agencies and from providers of DVC services. So I'm gonna start with my 
immediate left for introductions. I'll start with Sarah. Hello, my name is Sarah Dikas. I'm delighted to be here today um, at this very important uh, meeting. And um, I am a white woman. I'm wearing a peach color jacket. I have straight hair um, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'll, I work with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in our Office of Legal Counsel where I head our disability team. Okay, thank you, Sarah and Vanessa. Hi, my name is Vanessa Labas, and I'm the co-founder of 360 Direct Video. I've worked in, uh, in and around the deaf community for about 22 years, and I'm really excited to be here and share all the knowledge we've gained over the last few years uh, with everyone today. Thank you. Oh, I didn't do my description. I'm so sorry. I am a Hispanic female um, in my mid-40s, and I have long, dark hair, tan skin, and I'm wearing a black dress and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. And Chris? Hello, are we standing when we make our comments? Um, please do. Okay. I'm Chris Sukup, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer, CEO, for Communication Services for the Deaf, or CSD. I'm a white male, bald, wearing a blue jacket, blue pants, and I'm delighted to be here today representing CSD. And CSD is a nonprofit community-based organization celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. So we're very proud of our history and our legacy of services. Through the years, we have navigated <laughs> and chartered a lot of different territories and innovation with TRS, VRS, for the past 15 years, we've been a part in supporting DVC and making DVC a reality. So we're really honored to be here today. Great. Hello, I'm Lisa Bothwell, white woman, short shoulder length brown hair, wearing a black blazer and a green shirt. I work for Health and Human Services, there are several agencies within Health and Human Services. Mine is ACL, or the Administration for Community Living. If you're not familiar with ACL and what we do, I'm sure many of you are you know, familiar with what we do in our own communities. Uh, we invest in nonprofit organizations, for example, the Centers for Independent Living, advocacy agencies, agencies that support the aging, uh, developmental dis councils. We want to ensure we are investing in those and that's a bit of my background. Did I catch everything? I think I did. Thank you. Hello everyone. I'm Robert McConnell, Telecommunications Access Specialist with the FCC. Again, I'm wearing the same thing I was at the beginning of this event. A <laughs> blue blazer or suit, green shirt, blue tie, and I've been here at the FCC now for 10 years. And I started here running the ASL support line. And now I've been here for over 10 years. And my duties have changed uh, over the time that I've been here. But I think the common thread has been that ASL support line and that has led me to the DVC. So I'm heavily involved with that and the programming associated with that. And I'm very invested in the success of DVC. And so I think also when we think about culture and government and thinking about having that direct reflection of one another in mind when doing that type of work. And so I think it's important to think about that uh, because I think it's important to have that presence here. We have the president of Gallaudet University here with us today. And uh, I used to be on the student body government, and I was the president myself of that organization at Gallaudet back in oh, about 15 years ago now at this point. And so I do recognize other SBG presidents who are present in this room today. Uh, and anyway, Gallaudet is a beacon of leadership for language and access, access for all. And so I would like to thank you for being present today from Gallaudet University. Great. Thanks so much, Robert. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, 
I'd like to get started with our, our first panel, and it's directed more towards our DVC panelists, Vanessa and Chris. Uh, maybe I'll start with Vanessa here. So what are some of the DVC options available today, your own services, the industry as it currently kind of exists out there? What can you, what can you tell us about it in the platform? platform options and call center options? I'll start. Um, I'll just use English so that I'm not sim comming and let the interpreters do their job. Um, I think the wonderful thing I've heard about today is options. And so when we decided to set up direct video calling solutions, options is everything we thought about. So there are some agencies in business who think it's very important to um, we already have our own deaf staff and we want to, we just need a platform. And that's great, we do that, we just lease a platform. And then there's some that just need full-time dedicated representatives, we do that. So platform options can work with um, you having a dedicated video phone line, a uh, phone number, you can use your existing one, you can set up a private one. You also can have a widget that's put on any website, any web page that you want. So you're not limited to video phone users. You're not limited to website visitors. You really can have the plethora of services available within the platform. Um, and that includes things that we get as hearing people, like welcome messages. Um, on hold music is on hold videos for us. So we like to have federal agencies or businesses make their own videos um, that while people are waiting for the next available representative, they're able to watch something and be entertained. Um, even when you're closed, after closed messages, holiday messages, um, everything that we get is supposed to be equivalent within this platform, and that's what that's kind of what we focus on when we looked at platform options. Well, thank you, and and Chris, would you like to add to that? Yeah. As Vanessa said, the range of options out there. It's important that we consider what's included in a successful DVC program, that we think of the various components of what makes DVC successful, starting with recruitment, methods of doing outreach to the deaf community, recruiting, successfully vetting and hiring, and then going into training and providing training to those new hires, developing a curriculum that is it well incorporates adult deaf learning pedagogy. So they are ready, so they are prepared to support callers. And then thinking about the operations, the environment that you create and the ability to coach, mentor, supervise, work with staff. So there's a range of considerations into operationalizing beyond just the technology that's used. So we need to think about that in terms of designing your program and what may influence your decision. Maybe do you want to attempt this yourself? Do I want to bring in an outside provider who has expertise, who has the ability to reach people and to create awareness of this program? I would say there's a continuum that exists between do it yourself in-house and contracting or outsourcing to experts in the field. And that allows for a variety of options. But I would say there's uh, different components to consider and ensuring that you are positioning that program for success. Great, thank you. Oh, and please, uh, Robert, you have something to add? The FCC was the first federal agency to implement DVC, and I'm looking back to 10 years ago when we had the engineers from MITRE, who are actually present here today as a vendor, uh, and so thank you, and that's who we use for the FCC platform, and I felt like you know, we were like an airplane going for our takeoff, but we were building the plane as we were flying it. And I look back and think about that experience. And I think the core principle behind DVC is just making sure that it is as equitable to a hearing person making a phone call as it possibly can be. And I remember that when we set that up here at the FCC at our old headquarters building, um, I'm sure that some of you remember that, but we got in a van and we went to the FCC 
uh, to their center, their building that was actually in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And we talked to the call center staff and we mapped out the different functionality and the different reasons people tend to call the FCC for what kind of issues and complaints they may have. So we understood the scope of our DVC program. And we knew that the FCC called, hearing people called the FCC for certain things, but did the deaf people's calls mirror that? And so we had to think about that and whether the scope was more narrow or wider from the deaf community so that we could provide the same service that hearing consumers are able to get from the FCC. And it all goes back to functional equivalence, and I think that's the whole purpose. Well, thank you, Robert. And well, that actually might be a good place to transition a little bit to our questions to talk to our hearing representatives and say, so what was your, uh, our federal agency representatives, what was your experience with um, setting up DVT and your agencies? We'll start with uh, Sarah. Sure. So, um, thank you. In our case, we, we opened our DVC line in late 2015. Um, and in the past calendar year, um, ending in June, we received um, in that year long period over 1,350 calls on the line. So it's really um, being fairly heavily used, which we're just delighted about. Um, and of course, we think that we recognize that the number of cases that we're receiving about workplace discrimination against people who are deaf or hard of hearing may, you know, this is one of the very important avenues that we have to receive those cases and to be able to act on those cases. So we're delighted with the, with the activity on the line and our ability to respond. It really arose, um, as I understand it, and I was not with the EEOC at the time, but we have s received some very fantastic information internally, um, really propelled by individuals within the organization who are um, ASL speakers who recognize this need and recognize that direct ASL to ASL communication would be incredibly important in terms of reaching the community and allowing them to communicate in their first language. Um, and in terms of um, some recommendations, of course, we would encourage any agencies considering the adoption of a DVC line to really do the same, to consult with ASL speakers that they might have already on their staff um, who could help them consider how best to set up the line. Great, thank you. And, and Lisa, how was the HHS experience with setting up DVC? Hi, uh, this is Lisa speaking. First, I want to explain a little bit about DIAL. It's the Disability Information and Access Line and it's an information and referral line to be able to connect people to local resources and services, specifically for independent living, and also for fundamental needs, for example, housing, transportation, healthcare services. So that's uh, what DIAL does. And now the history of DIAL is a little bit different. And it was established because of COVID back in 2021 because the presidential administration ha issued a national strategy for COVID response and for the pandemic preparedness. And so that document talks about advancing equity within COVID response and for future pandemics that may occur. And one thing that was a result of that document is that the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, had a pot of money and they were able to establish a hotline that was specifically to ensure that people with disabilities had access to vaccines. And so the CDC announced a partnership in March of 2021 with ACL, the Administration of Community Living, which is my agency, and they wanted to move forward with having a disability-specific hotline to ensure that people with disabilities had access to being able to receive the COVID vaccine and testing. So that was in March. Fast forward to May of 2021, the DIAL hotline was established. And that was a rapid turnaround time. 
we were able to do so very quickly because the ACL already had another hotline in place called the Elder Care Locator. Maybe I should fingerspell that again. The Elder Care Locator. And so that hotline was managed by US Aging. And so they administered that hotline. And so we had an agreement with ACL and US Aging because they already had the infrastructure in place. And that hotline had been running since 1991, providing referrals to elder services and different kinds of local organizations to be able to provide help with Medicare issues and being able to understand the system for people that may need help with Medicare and understanding all the intricacies of it. So that's the elder care locator hotline that we've had in place for a long time. So they decided that they wanted to leverage that system and so ACL would be able to contribute to that pot of money to US aging so that they could establish a mo uh, this other call line. And it, we were able to do it in three or four weeks and we were able to roll it out in May of that year, which is quite quick. I had another point that I wanted to make here. From there, we did not have DVC initially. Part of the agreement that we had with ACL and US Aging was to work with a group of subject matter experts, or SMEs, trying to make sure that I sign that the right way, with different organizations. There were actually eight different organizations that were a part of that group. And they referred to themselves as a consortium. And so they're a group of organizations, or a consortium, that were from the deaf community and leaders from the deaf community. And so they worked with them to make sure that the hotline was accessible to people that were deaf and hard of hearing. And as such, one of the recommendations was to establish direct video calling as a part of the hotline. And US Aging wasn't sure how to approach that or implement that because that was a new concept to them. Like we heard in the previous panel, we've had the TTYs and they thought that was sufficient. And so there was definitely a learning curve for US aging when it came to DVC. So we talked through two different options. One was doing it in-house, and we explained to them that if we were to do that in-house, the source code is free, and the software is free, but you would still have to maintain the technological aspect as well as hire people to staff it. And US aging, was uncertain about the feasibility of that, and they just weren't ready to go that route at the time. Because it was the middle of the pandemic, and they were trying to get this out as quickly as possible. So they weren't certain about that first option. So the second option was to contract it out, and they decided to go with that option. And I think I'll leave it at that for now. I think I've done my part. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's a wonderful option. So it, it did kind of pose kind of a, an initial question of like, what is the, what do you, what would you say is the first step when you want to consider? consider DVC, whether that you want to bring it to your agency's attention, you want to bring it forward, what, what is your best first step for getting that information? Is it just of independent research or is it more look, looking to a DVC provider and what kind of, what's that initial question you're looking for to understand like what information should you be bringing to a DVC provider or just Want to be, or what are those first questions as a DVC provider you ask an agency so that they can figure out what might work for the program? Now, Vanessa? We've noticed that everyone wants data, everyone wants research, but this is a new and innovative solution. And so there is some amazing research that's been done over the years. We know we see reduced call times of 42%. We see um, the ability to create jobs for the deaf community. We see a lot of benefits to DVC that have been proven. 
but we always say get the data. Um, sometimes, sometimes companies will tell us, well, we're not getting that much call volume on our TTYs. We don't think deaf people are calling us. And we just kind of chuckle and say, they are calling you, you're just not tracking it. So yes, TTY lines is one way to get the data. Your VRS minutes is another way to get some data. But if you have online chat, if you're using other solutions for the hearing community, deaf individuals are trying to use all of these options. And therefore, it's a conglomeration of data. We always recommend you start with a pilot. There's no reason you can't get bu budget or funding for a 12-month pilot, see it through all four seasons, see your call volume, attract it, make it aware, make sure that you're marketing it to the deaf community, you're letting them know it's there, and they will come. Build it and they will come. They're already there, They're, but the call volume will increase. And once you have that data from the 12-month pilot you're trying to get budget for, then the rest of it's gonna be easy. And uh, because those calls are coming. So we always say, you know, get the data you can, get funding for a pilot, use the statistics that are out there. We have great business cases that we've made, use cases, testimonials, um, get what you can, bring it, get it started, and then go from there. That's, that's fantastic. And, and you mentioned marketing there. So like if you're doing a pilot, if you're getting something started, what, uh, do we have recommendations for getting the word out, providing that outreach to the community that these line, that a line has been set up at your agency and how best to you know, reach the public to say, we have this other option, it's a great option. How, how, should, you know, how should it be presented on your website? Where, where to look for it? How to send that information forward? So, sir? So in our, in our case, um, we, we try to post our number, which is one eight four four two three four five one two two, 5122 um, at as many places as we can. So we have it on our main website, eeoc.gov. Um, we include it in all of our publications. Um, we feature it on our disability resources page um, in particular. Um, you know, we try to push it out um, as, as often as we can. We recently released a, a document focusing on the rights of people with hearing disabilities in the workplace. Um, and particularly like techn technological advancements that can be useful to them. So of course it's featured in that document as well. So we just try to, you know, have a multi-pronged approach. And I'll say um, visual, right? We're serving a community that is a visual. That's how they're getting their language. So therefore we work very hard on the signing widget. Um, if you'll look when, you, when you're finished, you can certainly come over. The widget that's in the corner can be put on a contact us page, your accessibility page. Pages that someone's already going to go to, like you said, they're already going to go to reach you in the old way and now they're gonna see a new way because they're gonna see sign language happening in the bottom corner of the screen. And that can be matched to your colors, your branding, things like that. And then the other way is we have a directory. And so every time we have a new customer, there's a directory on our website. So companies, so individuals aren't searching all these websites. Who happens to have it? Who doesn't? I loved the idea earlier of the logo, um, you know, one universal logo. If we come up with that, that's wonderful. But until then, um, we have a directory so people can just come to our page and kind of see what companies are using this, attract more uh, callers, attract more individuals that way. Just to add, and thank you, um, we also, of course, we do a, a videos in ASL, so we can, we can promote it there also. And then Chris, it looks like you had an initial, please. Yes, two pieces. One I do believe is truly important. When you're thinking about how to start, when, or where to go, it is important to include people with lived experience from the outset. When you're thinking about what your DVC program should look like, how to design it, uh, limitations, potential limitations that the deaf community or deaf callers are currently experiencing, involve them in the process of designing it. It's so important. And the parallel to that is getting the message out, getting it out to the deaf community, involving them, in engaging community-based organizations in getting the word out on the availability of DVC services and programming. It's very important. Uh, great, thank you. And I think we'll transition to some audience questions now. Uh, we've already gotten a, a number online, but we'll also reach out to those in the room to see if there are any questions present. All right, 
seeing none immediately, I'll let everybody think about it for a minute. I'll start with some audience questions. Uh, so the first question we got was, so DVC certainly seems like a great option, but what steps can agencies take to ensure that consumers are still getting to use their preferred communication platform, whether that's uh, VRS, another form of TRS, uh, a preference for that TT, TTY line that we talked about. How, what should an agency do to make sure that all the options are available to, to consumers so that they can communicate how best they can get their message across? Robert? This is Robert. I'm part of the Disability Rights Office, so I engage, you know, I'm part of the consumer engagement team. And often we talk about, you know, FCC addressing communication preference. And for every call that comes into us at the FCC, we have a drop down menu about how this person prefers to be contacted back, whether that's through video phone, voice phone call, mail, fax, or email. And so that really goes back to something that we ask the consumer first off, what their preferred mode of communication is. And as we've mentioned before, we have a lot of different modes of communication. And for example, people can reach out to us at the FCC through video phone it, with a number. They can also do it through the web browser to connect to us. And so we've got the web option. Also, they can email us. We also, on our platform, have the ability to text in real time, so type in real time. And we can type back and forth with the other person. And that's pretty unique uh, for a person who may have some visual issues or have some acuity issues. And so that may work for them as an option. But it's again, it goes back to asking the consumer what their preference is and making sure that the staff that you have on board are able to accommodate those preferences. And I'd also like to add to that with the FCC, we're at the point in our program where it's mature enough where we're able to find that oftentimes people that call us are calling us because other companies or other federal agencies have told them to call us. And so they end up calling us because they've been referred to us. And it's really quite interesting to see that happen, the word of mouth on how it's out there in the community. And I think it's kind of an organic thing. And hopefully that gets to the point of equivalence where they're calling us just like anyone else would call us through the voice call. Great, thank you. So another question, and this was mentioned a little bit initially, but, but it's about finding and training ASL fluent personnel to answer um, DVC calls. Maybe we started with the agencies that have decided to hire their own internal staff. What, what's that process like? How, you know, in terms of hiring new federal employees to handle these types of lines? And Sarah? So, um, of course, there can be many paths to, uh, to hiring federal employees, but one that we really wanted to flag today is the Schedule A hiring process. Um, this is a special process to, for agencies to hire federal government employees. It is very streamlined. Um, it can move much more quickly than the typical federal hiring process. Um, even for competitive positions, it is a non-competitive non non process. Um, that's not to suggest that the individuals are not qualified for the positions that they would obtain, but again, simply that the process is much um, more streamlined. Um, there even do not need to be job announcements for particular positions. And if someone is hired for the position for which they need to be qualified, they then go through a two-year probationary period after which they could be converted if they perform satisfactorily to a permanent position in the federal government. So um, I just want to mention that should agencies be considering adopting DVC, that would be a fantastic way to streamline the hiring of ASL fluent individuals um, who may be qualified for Schedule A by virtue of having what's called a targeted disability, which would include in most instances being deaf and hard of hearing. So just wanted to make sure that was something that might be on federal agencies' radar if they want to try to move a program forward. 
Great, thank you. And Vanessa? We also see sometimes some reticence. I mean, we're fortunate that Sarah and Lisa have the expertise and the acumen to run a program or to have individuals in place that can do the hiring and the recruitment and staffing. One thing we were talking about with a turnkey solution when considering insourcing versus outsourcing is finding qualified individuals. So just like um, I speak English, but that doesn't mean that everyone speaks really great English. And there have to be um, efficiency or proficiency um, proficiencies in place to make sure quality standards are set up. Um, when you outsource and you ensure that you have a quality service management team, the recruitment and the training and the hiring is kind of done for you. Um, one really important part to that with doing the staffing is that you're assured of that quality. Um, you're assured of a you know, ASLPI or some kind of screening that you don't have to worry about. Because sometimes for some of these federal agencies, we're talking about three people, maybe four, a team of five. Not all agencies need a dozen new um, positions. So when you're talking about only hiring two or three or four people or a small team, you want to avoid things like isolation, high turnover rates. We see in call centers right now turnover rates of 50 to 70 percent. And when you just have maybe two or three or four deaf individuals that you've brought on staff, you may be causing isolation to that team by not managing it. It's not just the hiring and recruitment and training, it's the day-to-day -day management. And so by kind of working with an organization that's deaf-led, um, or sometimes federal agencies have to have um, so much of a percentage of their contracts go to uh, veterans or disability-owned businesses. So we have like a certified, we're a certified disability-owned organization. Those types of things reduce turnover. We have a 9% turnover rate in our contact center as compared to that 50 to 70%. So when you're using deaf-led organizations and teams to do that hiring, recruitment, training, and staffing, you're able to keep those employees for a much longer time and avoid those feelings of isolation. Thank you. And then, yes, from FEMA. Hi, this is Aaron Kuby from FEMA again. I wanted to quickly add, we at FEMA right now are in the process of setting up DVC. Ooh, looks like I'm not on screen, sorry about that. We'll pause for a moment for the frame. Raise your hand, Aaron. Okay, now I'm on the frame so everyone can see me. So at FEMA, we're now in the process of deploying the DVC program, and we call ours a, that's a long acronym, that's Access Communication Survival Support Line. And we say that the ASL language is equivalent to the hearing people's survivors who are calling in for help, and they're able to access that directly. And so we've hired actually 10 deaf employees specifically to work that hotline for us for DVC. And they're being trained by hearing call center agents that run the similar program so they understand how the registration process works, but they will be using ASL to answer calls. And so that's the process we're going through to establish our program. And so that's one way that government agencies can do it, is you can hire deaf employees, but use existing staff members that you have to do the training or whatever other program you already have in place, and then just let the new staff members who use American Sign Language handle the actual call taking afterwards. Great, thank you. And then Sarah? Just wanted to make two quick follow-up points. One is um, we're fortunate within the EEOC to have um, ASL speakers on staff. So when our DVC line um, employees were hired, they were interviewed by EEOC staff in ASL. Um, and just the second point would be, with respect to Schedule A hiring, I think it's important to note um, for the deaf community, and Bobby, it's thrilling that you're here, and all that you do at um, Gallaudet is just remarkable. Um, your students and others may want to be aware that sometimes Schedule A hiring occurs because people, even before there has been any position announced, simply submit their resume and their qualification to be considered under Schedule A to agencies and they're just there 
um, for the agencies to then later select from. So that might be something that individuals may wish to consider if they're interested in working for particular agencies to simply submit their resumes in advance of any position being open so that they can later be considered. All right, thank you. And I, I think we have time for one more question. So we'll get to one last question. And then of course, any questions that have been submitted online, we will try to address and get answers for for everyone to make sure we get a response out. But for this question, it's a wonderfully technical question. So how do you work with the firewalls and VPNs at federal agencies? How do you make sure everything connects and get through those net important networks? I guess maybe I'll start. And it, it can go either to a state agency or, or sorry, a federal agency or a DVC provider. I'm not the technical person on my staff, but I will say we've been very fortunate that um, the platform we've designed has no downloads. And all it does to connect the widget, which is external, is just one line of code that goes into the website. So we actually can have someone have the widget and have access within 10 minutes without having to, um, we don't need to like come in and install anything at your location. So video phone users, those connections are already there, but the website callers that come in literally will click from the website, nothing will have to be downloaded, they'll give permission to use their video, and the call is live, which is very great. I don't know how the magic works, but I know that we don't have any issues uh, getting set up in that regard. Um, and then of course having things like SOC 2 security compliance is in place so that any data um, that comes over the network is, you know, secure and they know it's being handled well on our end. We also don't record um, the calls. If, if the entity or the agency wants to record them, that's absolutely fine. They can store it in their already secure locations so that we don't have any conflicts in that regard. We kind of uh, see that video line just like a phone line of being passed through. Um, hopefully that answers it without getting too technical for anyone. Well, thank you. Kristen? Yes, I think that's a difficult question to answer. It's a difficult question to answer because there is such a range of possibilities. If you're working with a federal agency and they want staff in their own call center, there's different technological considerations involved to ensure that that is the appropriate system. If they're outsourcing and we are operating it for that agency, then the considerations in that situation, again, differ. They may involve integration with their data systems, with their CRMs, with the technologies, the various technologies they use to support their consumer interactions with their call center platforms. There's lots of information, security considerations. We have a lot of experience in terms of retaining require obtaining required security information and certifications to support the various expectations and duties involved in working with a federal agency. There are a number of different possibilities. I do believe it requires a close partnership, a close working relationship with the engineering and IT teams of each of those agencies. Thank you. And then Robert? So again, going back to 2016, uh, when we did our DVC showcase at the old FCC headquarters, uh, we dealt with a similar question. And I think all of those answers are quite similar and they're not much different than they were back in 2016. But I will say the big difference is that the federal government it is different than it was 10 years ago because video communications was something that was an afterthought and it was an ad hoc to business that was being done on a daily basis in regular operations because everything was done on an analog phone. That was until the pandemic hit and then video conferencing became mainstream and everyone wanted to be able to have access to Zoom or Teams to be able to complete their work tasks and it wasn't something that was unique to the deaf community because everyone else was utilizing it as well and that has made everything else so much easier and I would say that the IT people here now are aware that, that video is the priority, and so that definitely is an evolution with how we're able to handle multimedia calls and how the federal government is more accepting and receptive to video calls and video technology. I'd also would say that there are increased uh, 
security issues and measures in place at all of our agencies, and I think DVC platforms are all web-based, which actually helps to be able to make sure we're able to pass any kind of security certificates that we have in place at our respective agencies. All right, and with that, I thank you all, and please join me in thanking our panelists for their time today and for your wonderful answers to these questions, and I will turn things back over to Susie. Hello again. I am still digesting all of the information just shared. So much to think about. Oh, perfect. Allow me to repeat that. This is Susie. I was just mentioning, I'm still digesting all the information you've just shared. When there's a will, there's a way. If you build it, they will come. So here we have the experts with us to explain all the various ways and methods to making this possible. Thank you for that. And we have an exhibit period following in a bit to where you can try out for yourselves and see what DVC looks like and how it works. With that, I would like to invite our chief, Alejandro Rourke, to give closing remarks. Alejandro. And thank you, panelists. Thank you, Susie, and thank all of you again today um, to our panelists, to everyone that made the time to join us in person, um, to all of you who are tuning in online. My name is Alejandro Rourke. I'm the chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. I am a Latino male in my 40s, um, so maybe young presenting, I've been told, I'm wearing a blue suit and a blue tie. So very happy to be here. This afternoon has been an important and informative discussion about direct video calling and the important role that it plays um, in ensuring the federal government services are available and accessible to everyone. Personal to me in my role as Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, through both our Consumer Policy Division and our Disability Rights Office, is developing and implementing the FCC's consumer policies and serving as the agency's connection to the American consumer, in part by ensuring that we have a reliable, consistent, um, and accessible stakeholder engagement process um, that allows the Commission to promote policies that extend our communication resources to everyone, everywhere. We've learned today from our speakers and our panelists that in order to achieve our shared goal of building a federal government that works and serves everyone, we have to prioritize, center, and deploy accessible services like DVC and ensure that we are collaborating across the federal government so that people who use ASL can participate and engage in federal programs, services, and activities. To all of our federal partners in the room, thank you so much for your partnership and collaboration. Please know um, that we are available and happy to connect with you all directly if we can be of any support to your respective efforts. You know, we've, we've also, and since my time working at the FCC, have, have done quite a lot of procurement and security things that kind of go along with everything. So just know that if it can pass the scrutiny and the lawyers and the procurement folks at the Federal Communications Commission, I think that you are far more ahead than we were when we started. And we are happy to share all of those kind of best practices and connect you directly to our IT teams, um, all of our you know, legal teams that help uh, make this possible. Um, so just know that that is available to you and the conversation begins today, doesn't end today. Um, so to further illustrate how DVC technology works in real time, we have set up an exhibit hall um, where vendors are facilitating hands-on demonstrations and can further clarify any points of interest. So the exhibitors will be available from now until about four o'clock. So please take a moment to explore at your own pace. Um, and lastly, I would like to extend my personal gratitude to the many DRO staff members who have made today's event possible, including Susie Rosen Singleton, Michael Scott, uh, Bill Wallace, uh, Ivy Banejo, Robert McConnell, Tim Wynn, um, and uh, Salida Griffiths, our interpreting team, um, Ella Fagon and Amy Cressup, our CMR staff, Jeff Reardon, uh, Greg Huff, our captioners, interpreters, and again, to all of our guests and speakers, thank you all for taking the time and, um, and for your attention today. And this concludes the speaking portion of our program. So again, thank you. Um, please feel free to ask any questions. We have all the experts in the room, so please explore, and it's been really great to share, be in community with you all. Thanks.